Hello, everyone. How are we tonight? Good. Um, for those of you, actually, let me start by prayer. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you are here with us and that you care about every piece of us. The pieces that we're ready to explore and the parts of us that we're not. And I thank you that um, you don't call us to be anywhere but where we are right now. Um, and just the next step, that there are no shoulds or have tos or need tos in your kingdom, but acceptance and grace. And so I pray as, as we discover more about what it means to take care of our mental health, that you will be in and through this topic, that you will start to reframe maybe some ideas and beliefs that we have around this topic, and um, you will show us the immeasurable amount of your grace that meets us as we discover this. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Brianna, or for most of you who know me as Bree. Um, I am a elementary teacher at West Nairobi School currently, but the Lord has been calling me into a new season, so I'm currently working to complete my master's in counseling. So mental health is a huge topic, or mental wellness is a huge topic of a passion of my heart. And so um, Chris has asked me to just come to share some of my learnings and growth that the Lord has called me into in the past few years. So um, <clears throat> currently one of my positions at WNS is social emotional teacher. So I teach preschoolers, so four-year-olds to 12-year-olds about their emotions. And it's a super fun um, class. And one of the questions that I often ask in the class is, who is in charge of your emotions? Who, is in, who, who, who has the power to change your emotions? And I love it because depending on the age and how much I've asked this question, a lot of them will either point to two places. They'll point to me, like you're in charge of my emotions and changing my emotions. Or there's always a few that are like, God, <laughs> like that's, he's right. He's, no, no, no. Who's in charge of your emotions? And the idea is for them to point to themselves. Who's in charge of your emotions? I'm in charge of my emotions. So then the second question is, okay, where does your superpower lie to change your emotions? Anyone want to guess? So a lot of kids will go like this. Like my heart. It's my heart. That's where the superpower lies. No. Where is the superpower that has the power to change your emotions? It's in your head. It's your thoughts. Right? And so, I know some of you are like, yes, I got that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, but as adults, that's something that a lot of us know, but it's really difficult when we put it into practice. And what I want to talk about today is, I think that a lot in our culture is mental wellness, mental health, talking about anxiety and depression that's on the rise right now. Being able to recognize I have emotions and they impact me. This is kind of like in this category over here. And then here's Jesus over here, right? And they don't really mix. Sure, I can hear a church sermon that says I'm supposed to like mourn before God or like tell him that I'm upset. But what does that actually look like in practice? And so what God has been teaching me in the last couple of years is these aren't supposed to be separate. That the creator of the world who has created my thoughts, who's created my emotions, and the subsequent behaviors that I have, those things, and even the sinful ones, and him, he wants to be like this together. How do I do that? What does that look like? So <clears throat> a lot of what I say, or some of what I say, may challenge the way that you've been taught and what you, how you think about this. And I don't want it to just be my words, and I don't want it to just be the words that have been told to you, but what my hope is that we can seek more of a kingdom mindset to see how our Father has for us to explore this topic, right? And so I recognize that someone who is from a different, like I'm from Canada, and I, I'm a, from a different culture than a lot of you, a lot of you may be thinking, you, you can't tell me how to think on this topic, and that's absolutely right, but I hope that we can look into scriptures together and I can share what I've been learning, and maybe you can take one or two things from this talk. Does that sound okay to everyone? Okay. So we're going to be working from 
a scripture in Romans. Yeah, I love this. I've been exploring the Passion Translation lately. Now, I don't think it's the only translation you should read, but I do believe that it has a lot of um, beautiful words and ways of describing a scripture that we've read over and over and over for some of us in maybe a new light. So, Romans 1 says, Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. So because we have faith in Jesus... I have the righteousness of God transferred to me. And now he declares me flawless in his eyes. Can we all say that? Flawless? So like any shame, any guilt, any condemnation, flawless. Those cannot be together. This means that we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God. So for those of you who are like, I don't have peace, let's spend more time with God. There's peace there to be found. All because of what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access, not sometimes access, permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. And so I think in pictures, and right here I have a little stick figure going like this, and there's joy bursting forth from them as they celebrate the hope of experiencing the glory, the greatness of God. But... I want to say, but, can you tell him an elementary teacher? Yeah. We're going to have fun together. That's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence, knowing, okay, let's stop there. Where does the power to change your emotion lie? Point to where your power to change your emotions lie, here. So the, I have a joyful confidence when I know, when I speak it, when I have the perspective, when I hold on to knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance. And patient endurance will refine our character. And this character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience, what are we experiencing? The endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So, we're going to be looking at this verse and the, the alignment of what does our mental health have to do with this? What does our mental wellness have to do with this? And what I'm going to propose to you is a couple things. One thing, your mental wellness is not a destination. It's not you're not going to get to this epitome of wellness within you. Wouldn't that be great? Okay, let me clarify. When you get to heaven, you will get that. But right now you won't, and that's okay. But instead, there's these pressures in life that happen. And what a lot of us think of it as, these pressures are external, whether it's a, a loved one dying, whether it's trauma of some sort, whether it's anxiety or depression all of these things are external happening to us. But if we have the power to change our emotions, what I am going to submit to you is it is not, these pressures are not the external things, but it's how our mind is making sense of it, what we're thinking about it, and how our emotions are responding to it. Those are the pressures. And so somehow in this verse, it's talking about somehow if we handle these pressures, our interpretations, our thoughts, our emotions, well, we'll produce perseverance. And that perseverance will create in us a character that is Christ-like. And throughout this whole process, we can have hope because the cascading love of God pours into our hearts through the Holy Spirit in us. So, what does this look like? So as I was praying... <clears throat> for the Lord to give me a picture um, that would like 
kind of rely, like, relate to how I saw mental health. Um, he brought up Mount Wanganat. How many of you have been to Mount Wanganat before? Okay, yeah. So for those of you who know, Mount Wanganat is like this really steep slope up, and then there's the rim of the volcano that you walk around, and then you walk down. And then for those of you who just want to see the view, you walk up, you look around, you walk down, right? So um, I've written out my experience. I'm going to read it to you guys. And for those of you who think that I am melodramatic, um, you are correct, okay? Um, but here, here's my story. So I used to, pa I would used to drive past Mount Longanot, and I think, I never want to hike that. It seemed too hard and too long, and frankly, I don't really love hiking or being hot or dying. Yet, seven months ago, I willingly signed up to hike this mountain with my roommate and friend Marissa that I had sworn to never venture to. When I had finally decided to hike the mountain, I told people, I asked them how they prepared, and I, for weeks, planned in my head how I could tackle this mountain. Two days before, I began to drink more water and eat extra healthily. Like somehow, changing my diet two days before would give me the superhuman strength that I needed to accomplish this task. I didn't even do leg day the day before at the gym um, and ensured that I went to bed really well the night before. On the day of the hike, we left at 4.30 a.m. and drove to the base. Leaving so early, we had planned to be at the peak by 8.30 before the sun got to us. I was pumped, filled through with adrenaline and coffee, and I was ready. The funny thing with hiking is that we can get to the point of thinking, I can do this. I want to do this. But then we take the first few steps and suddenly stand at the base of this mountain, looking at the height and terrain and thinking, uh, never mind. It feels too hard, too much, and what if I don't succeed? So we began the hike, and the chill of the morning, untouched by the sun, made it a bit cold. I was playfully running ahead and walking briskly and joking that this whole hiking thing wasn't that hard. Then, as the slope increased, we decreased in speed. Or at least I did. May walked ahead of us, and I made dinosaur noises of frustration, complaining about how hard it was and declaring this was all stupid. As we continued, May kept mentioning this point up ahead that she thought was the ledge, the beginning of the rim. Rounding what we thought was the ledge, we discovered that we, or she, was wrong, and I had I was prepared to turn around. We were only halfway up the slope. Climbing further, we had reached the ledge, and it was a triumph. As the sun broke over the hills, we sat and ate breakfast, feeling accomplished. I was a bit more through my water than I had planned, and my shoes were already giving me blisters, but I figured that it all would be okay. Continuing forwards, I switched to my flip-flops and tried to slow down and on drinking water. Flip-flops. Why were flip-flops my backup shoes? I was clearly not prepared for this journey. By the time we came, began to climb to the peak of the rim, I was in rough shape. And for those of you who knew, we went around the short way. So like the peak of the rim was like the first part of the journey around. For me, hiking triggered some unpleasant beliefs from when I was younger. And this often results in me crying once or twice or four times if I am doing any strenuous activities. So, slowing down even more, I struggled in flip-flops to climb the peak. My skin consisted of layers of sunscreen, sweat, dirt, tears, and more sweat mixing in with the tears. May was barely tolerating my dinosaur noises by this point, and I was done. Making the peak, we took a few photos and ate a granola bar, and I thought, wow, this is great! It's just downhill from here. Right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> With little water, a hot sun above, and morale low, we continued our trek. As we began our descent, I realized that it wasn't so much a descent as much of a descent and then ascent and then descent and then ascent over and over and over. I was frustrated. This was supposed to be the easy part. To top this all off, some people run the mountain and the rim for fun. They would ask us if this was our second trip around the rim. 
or when we when or when we had started our hike and then when we told them how long we had been on the hike they looked at us a little bit surprised with how long we had been on this journey i had the only the energy to cast them a glare of hatred <laughs> yeah as we walked i slowed down a little more and noticed the amazing view for the first time the geography below us on either side, the beautiful mountain that we were climbing. Wow. I felt Holy Spirit draw to me the friend, my attention to the friend that I was hiking with, trying to converse with me, encouraging me to eat, and even taking time to understand that this was difficult for me. <laughs> she would cheer me on and tell me how proud that she was that I had made it this far. It really was amazing that I had made it this far. <laughs> Getting closer to the end of the rim, large groups of churches, groups of friends were ascending the mountain, and people who had only planned to hike the mountain to take a look and then turn around and go back down. And I felt great pride right as in my chest. I was the one who made it around. I didn't need the recognition, but I was proud of myself. We passed probably two, over 200 people climbing down the mountain as they were climbing up as we were climbing down. Some people asked how long the journey was, others cheered us on, and some commented on how I had made the whole way in flip-flops. The thing was, I hadn't planned to, but was forced to due to the nasty blisters that had been on my feet. Rounding the finish line and chugging a whole cold soda was a small joy in my day. My hike around Longanot Long was not easy, and I couldn't call, I would not call it fun either. However, in the journey, I grew in understanding my capacity and my ability. I was able to do the hard thing, and though it was much more of a challenge than I had expected, Jesus showed me how this can relate to our relationship with him. People say growth is not linear. I think our growth with him is like Mount Longanot. A little up, a little down, a little up, a little down. But always forward. How we prepare, what we do, and who we bring with us can make a whole lot of a difference in how far we make it. So how do we prepare? What do we do on this journey to do our journey, mental health journey well? If the destination isn't a fully formed wellness in us for the rest of our life on earth, what does it look like to do it well? So I think I'm going to suggest to you today we do, there's three things. Um, we can do our mental health journey well when we bring a certain person with us, when we understand the supplies we are to bring and how to utilize them, and then our outlook of the journey in ourselves will greatly impact how we handle these things. Um, so first, you can go to the next one. <clears throat> how do we prepare and who do we bring? So for those of you who've grown up in church, you're like, I know the answer is Jesus. Okay. I'm so glad that you know that answer. Um, I want to draw to you two parts of our verse in Romans. First of all, um, even in times of trouble. So not if, even in. I watched this reel the other day, and he was like, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not if, when. He's like, I'm not pitching my tent there, but I am walking through it, right? So for those of us who are feeling like we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, or for those of you who are like, I'm pretty good right now, who, how we do relationship with Jesus will impact our mental being, our mental well-being, our emotional well-being. So not only in times of, even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence, but at the end, what else do we have is we experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit living in us. So somehow I believe that for the end part of the Holy Spirit and the love of God cascading into our hearts helps us in those troubles. What does that look like? Well, I imagine our journey, right? So we're on this journey of Mount Longanot. And imagine if we're just continually walking around the rim of Longanot. Like that's how I feel like our mental health is, right? Some days I'm great. Other days it's like, I feel super crummy. One day of the week I could be like, I'm really struggling with trauma from 20 years ago. And the other day I'm like, I love life. <laughs> you're a little bit manic, and you're like, what is wrong with me? Um, but then there's, other, there's others of you that are like, it's been two months, and I feel this way every single day. 
right? So how do I invite Jesus into those pieces, whether I'm feeling different every day or every week, or I'm feeling a continuous good or a continuous bad? Well, I just imagine him walking with you. And it's not even if you invite him. Jesus is walking with you, whether you want him there or not. The difference is, is how you utilize him being there, right? Like for me, at times, May would either walk ahead or be walking beside me, and I'm like low-key crying, but I'm just looking away like, <laughs> it's fine, <laughs> right? Because I'm so just frustrated at myself for struggling. And I think about how we do that with Jesus. Like, okay, God, it's fine. I'm in your presence. Hallelujah. But he wants that part of you. He wants every part of you. He wants to talk about it. And in these past few years of working through um, deep, deep healing, I realized, wow, I actually need to just tell God it sucks sometimes. So like if I'm walking uphill and it's really hard, I'm like, Jesus, it sucks. I'm angry, partially because I sometimes feel like you're, you're the one who's like, this, you could have stopped this, right? But if the purpose is the presence of Christ rather than the destination, he might be keeping you on that uphill until you turn to him and start talking to him. Because he wants you and he wants you to see him more than he wants you to stop struggling in that moment. And in this verse, we're talking about our problems, our pressures produce perseverance and perseverance character and character leads us back to hope. And what if our hope is more valuable than our current comfort? And what if he's wanting us to stay there in that uphill for a minute so that we learn to turn to talk to him about the suckiness of the uphill or the downhill, down, which is like kind of contrary to other analogies, but like downhill's easy, right? So when I'm stopping, I could be talking to Jesus being like, wow, look at the beautiful scenery. Wow, look at this beautiful place. Look at how far I've come. It's in the times of good that I can look back and be like, we, we did that together? Wow, thanks, Jesus. The purpose is his presence. The point is not full healing. The point is him. And when the point is him, we use every season to come closer to him. And when we have that, we can experience this joy bubbling forth. We can experience the fullness of what it means, the love of God pouring into us. So, I'm actually going to change that from who we bring to Jesus is already there. Are you talking to him? Okay, the next one, what I bring in my backpack. Backpack always reminds me of Dora the Explorer. But, um, so I have my backpack. I have my tools and the things that I bring. And um, n not many of you know me, but I love snacks. Okay, so I brought like five different snacks and my coffee mug and a water and sandwiches on this hike. And you're like, oh, now I see why it was hard for you, Brianna. <laughs> okay, um, you're right. <laughs> um, but I, the point of that is, is what I bring with me will greatly help me. If I bring all chocolate bars, will that help me? No. Um, but what if, what if I ate all of my lunch and my snacks at the beginning of the hike? Would that help me too? No. So I can bring the nutrition things, but I also have to space it out, right? I have to know when and how to use them to help me. And some of them I'll use beforehand. Ooh, I know I'm going to get like really thirsty hiking this hill, so I'm going to drink some water to prepare my strength. But I also sometimes need a replenishing. I'm feeling really drained right now. I need to eat a sandwich. I need to stop. And so how we care for our mental health even in good times or hard times, we're filling ourselves up with resources that are helpful to grow us in nourishment and um, joy. And this has a lot to do with brain chemistry too, but let's go through. So we have the four M's of mental health. <clears throat> My counselor uses this a lot. If I'm having a really hard week, she's like, what's the four, one of the four M's of mental health you're gonna do this week? So. You don't have to, I'm not doing that to you, okay, because that annoys me. But my whole point is, what are the resources you're using? So our first M is mastery, getting good at something. So I'm going to do this, if you're having a good season, just get good at something anyways, 
that's replenishing yourself and nourishing yourself for the next uphill. If you're in a hard season, what's something that you can really focus on? Whether learning a new instrument or getting really good at an instrument or finding an art if you like art or a sport or exercise. If you like lifting weights, go lift weights. And that transfers into movement, but the whole point of that is, is that when we're focused on getting really good at something, we have cycles of emotions and it interrupts that cycle of emotion when we can focus on getting really good at something. Meaningful connection. I'm gonna like do my little like major point I wanted to make and then I'm gonna talk about community. If I'm hiking the mountain and I'm really struggling, say for instance, it wasn't Mount Longanot, but it was a really hard mountain that was, had a lot of tricky places. Would I, as an inexperienced mountain hiker, know how to hike that? No. I would need help. There are parts of your journey that you're not gonna know how to get through on your own. And you're gonna need community. I'm gonna suggest that some of you, depending on the challenges that you've been through, are going to need counseling. And I understand as, um, as I've been here for six years that counseling is kind of not as well accepted here in Kenya, right? And it's almost shameful if you need it. It's like I can do it on my own. But my challenges to you is if you're struggling with something over and over and over and over again and you're not seeming to get it, why are you climbing the part that you don't know how to do on your own? Because you ask someone for help. A lot of counseling is just perspective taking, maybe helping you see it a different way or learning a different skill to grab a boulder in a different way than you knew before. Jesus is our counselor too. It says the Holy Spirit is our counselor. So I'm not negating that. The presence of God is deeply healing. But for myself, who's now in my third counselor of my life, I can say that there's deep benefit to it for a lot of people. Meaningful connections also with our people. So our resources that we can use, whether in times of good or times of hard, is connecting with people. And if you're in a really time of, um, depression or anxiety, don't try to reach out to someone new. That's too hard, right? Go find someone you know. Go just be around the people you love. If you're saying, I don't have a lot of that, where are your family, where are your friends? Or just go join a community group and say nothing. Just be around people. But be around people that are good influences and are gonna nourish yourself. If you're just bringing chocolate bars and those people aren't nourishing your soul, then that's not gonna help you. That actually might deter you. If I eat five chocolate bars and try to climb a mountain, my side's gonna hurt, right? So who are the people that you're bringing around you to nourish you? And I would also say, there's beauty in vulnerability, even in small pieces of vulnerability. So if you're having a hard time and you do have that community, you feel like you could risk vulnerability and say, hey, I'm having a hard time, there is deep healing to that. Okay, movement. I'm not saying that you need 30 minutes of strenuous exercise a day, okay? I'm just saying move your body. Whether it's yoga, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's going for a walk with a friend, hey, two of those at the same time. Meaningful connection and movement, right? But in a way that you get your body moving that actually helps you to bring different hormones and different chemicals into your body to interrupt the other ones, especially if you're suffering with any anxiety or any stress. Those hormones actually block your body's ability to receive good hormones. So you need to be moving your body to be able to interrupt that stress hormone cycle that's happening in you. And lastly, um, I said mindful, mindfulness, but it's actually mindfulness and meditation, and really what I mean by that is two things. One, sitting in the moment and just right, being aware of your five senses. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? What am I not thinking? Sorry, that was totally, let me try that again. What am I feeling in my body? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? What am I touching? Just being aware in the moment with no judgment. And what I mean by that is being able to cultivate that practice of not being in the past, the, oh, I should have been doing this, or I need, like, I could have done that, or being in the future to the what ifs, but I'm just being in the present and aware of my body. Even this week, I had so much anxiety because I was coming to speak to all you, and 
It was, I, was, I was anxious this week, but I've been practicing this, this um, practice of mindfulness enough that I was able to go, oh, I'm feeling anxious right now. I'm not judging myself. I'm not hard on myself. I'm actually not trying to get rid of it either. It's just sitting with it. What are you telling me? What's my emotion telling me? And being able to hold it without judgment. And then lastly, meditation, which I'm going to call prayer. But it's not an M word, so we're going to say meditation, but you guys know I mean prayer, okay? Spending time in the presence of God without an agenda. Not coming with your prayer list first, but just sitting there until he shows up. Or sitting with the presence of Jesus, and I picture him in front of me, and I I talk to him. Cultivating that practice of prayer and meditation, even in the secular world, it talks a whole lot about how connection with a higher being can be so good to your mental health. So us, who knows the true higher being, the Father, why not use this resource to grow your mental health? Okay, so those are the things we have in our backpack. We have Jesus beside us. We have our things in our backpack. Our last one is our outlook of ourself and our journey. Okay, so this is where the stories and the narratives that are coming through your mind right now of how you see your mental health journey might contradict with mine, okay? And that's so good because what I want to do is present information and you can either go, ah, uh, no, or, huh, maybe I want to see this a bit different. I'm imagining us standing on our hike with Jesus. We have our backpack of resources, but how do I see going forward? First of all, we're all in different seasons, right? Some of you are like, I'm great today. Others of you are like, I'm great today, but this morning, whew, Right? Others of you are really struggling. So we're all at different places, but we can't compare ourselves. If I had a broken leg and was hiking Mount Longanot, would you be expecting me to like run the same amount as someone else or walk the same amount as someone else? No. Or for instance, if you're someone who is the first time hiking, hiking up Mount Longanot and you have someone else who's done it every day for the last three years, do you expect us to do the same? No but especially because you don't know what other people have in their ability to do this journey, why are we spending so much time comparing ourselves? You all have different wounds and different hurts and different experiences and different resources in your backpack. I grew up with a mom who's a counselor, okay? In a really safe home. I had a lot of resources that are from my upbringing that some of you may not have. So you can't sit there and go, well, why, why am I not there, right? Why am I not walking as fast? Why am I not? We're on a totally different journey, right? I have different hurts than you too, and that's okay. But my encouragement is, is to say there's different seasons and there's different journeys and you can't compare it, but at the same time, don't be going up the mountain, right? Imagine me walking around the rim to the peak and I'm coming back down and I'm hiking a similar hill to back there. And I can't go, well, I hiked this hill back there. Why am I hiking it again? I have trauma that I constantly am surprised with it coming up again. And I'm like, I dealt with that, right? Why, why am I going to counseling again? But... There's different layers and there's different ways that we can work through that and grow. And again, if the point is his presence, we're not trying to evaluate. We're not evaluating, should I be doing this? We're just going, Jesus, what do you have for me? Oh, you're bringing this up again? Huh, what do you have to say? What can I lay down before you? What can I give over to you? Maybe I'm carrying too much. Maybe I'm dealing with anxiety. Am I, am I trying to control too much right now? Jesus, what do you want me to submit to you again? Okay, it's a continual journey. Everyone say continual. Okay, when I wrote this, I was like, continual, <laughs> okay? And I think I went um, a little bit into uh, the, this one. I think I, I said both at the same time, but we're on a journey. It's never ending. So don't judge it when it comes up again or when something new comes and you feel like, I am seriously hiking uphill for four years. What is happening, right? Or I feel like I've hiked this hill again. 
but just take it in stride, knowing that every challenge and every good is an invitation from Jesus to come closer to him. And if we start to see it that way, it's going to help us. Okay. You can click to the last two because, oh, I didn't talk about Romans. Okay, that's okay. I'll come back to that. You can go to two more. Thank you. Okay. It's less about being, getting it right. And it's more about showing up daily and trying. So imagine if we're hiking a Mount Longanot forever <laughs> until we die, okay, because that's our mental health journey. And I'm having a hard day and I sit down. I don't want to go today, okay? And say um, I'm talking to Jesus about it and he says, that's okay. I just want you to take two steps. Are those two steps worthless? No, right? So if you're struggling with depression and you get out of bed and you do a 10-minute walk, give yourself a high five, right? It's not about doing the best every day. If I'm hiking Mount Longanot for my entire life, there are going to be days where I just want to sit down. And that's okay, right? So for you, what does that look like? And that ties into my last one, cultivate self-compassion. You can either be your greatest ally or your worst enemy. I imagine this. I was laughing this morning. I guess I was talking to Jesus about it because I had this picture of, you know, me and him walking and he's like, I love you. You're doing so great. Look at how, how much you've come. This is a really hard part. Like, you're doing awesome. What do you need from me? Do you want to just like talk about how hard it is? Like, this is Jesus talking to me. And I just had this moment of, me standing over here going, man, I suck. This is so hard. I don't want God to, God to see me like this. I'm not going to talk to him about this. Look, other people are up ahead of me. They're running down that hill. Like, I, what is wrong with me? There must be something. I'm the problem here. Do you hear myself talk compared to how Jesus sees me? If anything you say to yourself doesn't align with the word of God and what he says about you, it's not true. Our power to change our emotions starts in our minds. How are you speaking to yourself about you? It will empower you or it will greatly deter you from being healthy and well. <clears throat> and I think as you don't have to go back to it, but I am going to talk about Romans again, is in this verse in Romans, as he talks about, even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing. So we have to keep in mind, when I'm going through this challenge, the purpose is your presence, and these pressures are producing in me perseverance, and this perseverance is producing in me character, and I know this character is leading me back to deeper hope in you, right? But it takes knowing it. It takes talking to yourself. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm very aware of how passionate I get about this, so I'm just taking a little minute. <laughs> and I say none of this in condemnation or guilt or shame. I'm not shaming or blaming you. The Lord has great compassion for you. So if there's anything in you right now that's feeling like, um, oh man, I'm doing so much wrong. God does not see you like that. He just has so much grace. He's like, come back to me. I just want to do this with you, like him open arms, right? Like, I just want to hug you and kiss your face and be with you in this. I care for you. I care for your deepest hurts. I care for your deepest wounds. I care for the ways that you're struggling, and you know that you're in a cycle of bad habits, whether you're avoiding or you're doing a sin you don't like or you're feeling like, I can't even connect with my emotions. What is this chick talking about? That's okay. God knows you right? I'm not saying you have to be anywhere. I'm just saying, if you can figure out where you are, if you can figure out the next step and maybe some different resources or ways to look at it differently, you might get to more of the abundance of Christ that we're promised. Doesn't that sound wonderful? To experience the fullness of God pouring into us, his cascading grace and love. One of the biggest ways of prayer that I use is um, called imaginative prayer. And I believe that the Holy Spirit can infuse our imagination to allow us to meet with God. Because if God's created our imagination, why wouldn't he use it? 
Now I know that some of, for some of us, this will work easier because of the way our brains are made. So if this doesn't work for you, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. Just we're all created differently and that's beautiful. What I am gonna say is whether you can, if you've been to Mount Longanot or not, I'm gonna give us a moment and I want us to close our eyes. Hmm. Can we do something funny right now together? Okay, sit up in your chair. <clears throat> okay? This is, I do this with my kids. It's a regulating strategy, but you've just heard me talk a lot, and I want us to like be prepared to give God the greatest amount of space to talk to us, okay? So you're going to take your hands, and you're going to face your palms like this towards you, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to take, put, cross your hands over like this, so my palms are facing me, and I'm going to wrap my two thumbs like this. You're going to put it on your chest. And what you're going to do is, do you feel that bone right there? What I want you to do is just put your hands right underneath that bone. So I'm not on it. I'm just right underneath it so that my pointer fingers feel the bone to the side of it. And what you're going to do is you're just going to do this. Like if you've ever burped a baby before, that kind of pressure. So not super light, but not because I have some fourth grade boys that are like, <laughs> but just back and forth, <laughs> back and forth. And what you're doing is there's a nerve here that's right under, lying right underneath that we're hitting. That's helping regulate our emotions right now. And by doing this over and over, especially if I was to have you do it for a couple minutes, you'd be able to start to feel the sensation calmness in your being. And what it's doing is actually resetting your nervous system back to like homeostasis. And if you're really, I see a couple of us and it's totally okay, it's the way that our brain works, are having trouble with like the right or left, I'll sometimes say it in my head like right, left. Right, left, right, left, just to help me get the pattern down. Do you guys feel a difference? Now, if you have a jacket on, it might not be as effective, but it just helps us to focus. So um, now that I have you sitting up, we're going to close our eyes. Take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, like you're blowing out a birthday cake. One more time, breathing through your nose, out through your mouth. And I just want you to give, have a moment. We're going to say, in our minds, and our hearts, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our imagination. Sanctify our imagination so that we can meet with you now, Jesus. I, I ask for you to show each one of us where we are at on the mountain. So maybe you're at the base. Maybe you're climbing the steep slope to the rim. Maybe you feel like you're walking the rim. Are you starting an uphill? Are you midway through an uphill? Are you walking downhill right now and looking at the view? Just get to a place where you can picture your surroundings. And just to help me, can you put your thumb up once you're there? And do you feel like you have your space? giving me a thumbs up helps me to know who are there. Once you feel like, yeah, I know where I am on the mountain. Why don't you just take a minute and notice what you see around you. Whether it's your feeling or what you see, what you hear. Just notice the senses around you in your imagination. Okay, so Jesus is beside you. Maybe he's behind you. Maybe you don't want him beside you. But just invite him in and see where he... He wants to be. And if you can't picture him fully, that's okay too. So the first question I just want you to ask Jesus as you stay there with your eyes closed is, what he has to say about this point in your journey.
Now, before we get to resources, keeping your eyes closed, imagining Jesus there. And even if it's not, it's hard to picture it. Just allow God to speak to you in your heart, even if it's not within a picture, okay? I want you to ask him, is there anything in my backpack that's not helping me right now? This could be a mindset that I'm thinking, a negative thought process. This could be a person. This could be a habit. This could be a way of seeing him. But is there anything that's weighing me down? Even if you're not willing to give it up yet, just allow him to talk to you about it. I want you to see if there's any, ask him, are there any resources right now that you're offering me that you'd like me to take, whether it's a connection with someone or something you'd like me to master or more prayer time with you or um, a movement activity you'd like me to participate in this week? What's a resource you want me to utilize? Okay, and now finally I want you to stop if you are picturing yourself and look back at your journey so far. And I want you to ask him, how do you see me in this journey so far that I've been through? Finally, I just want you to take a minute and ask him, is there anything else you want me to know? As you just keep your eyes closed for a minute, um, I've, I've been feeling this, this sense of joyful confidence that we are to have, and Jesus has it too. He has joyful confidence over our journey because he knows that it's so much bigger and so much better than we can even imagine. And so, Jesus, I thank you for your joyful confidence that um, you never leave us, you never forsake us, but there's, there's actually joy in these pressures because they... They, they draw us closer to you. And when the point is you, when the point is your presence, when the point is joy in you, Lord, we, we ask for you to do whatever you have for us, that you will, you will lead us through, that you will draw us closer, that our hunger and our fire will just burn more and more for your presence and for your glory. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the, the ways that you have invited us in, that your righteousness is transferred to us, that we have an invitation to continually be in your kindness and your presence because of what Christ has done. May we not take that lightly, but may we be forever changed by that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I have no idea what time it is. Do we have time for prayer ministry? Tell it so or did I talk too long?
Okay. Um, my encouragement is, is if something has happened in you tonight that you're thinking, man, I want to repent, I want to turn, I want to do this differently, find someone to talk to. Uh, the, the leadership is here. I'm here. Find a space where you can go, I want to change, and like Jesus has done something. Because by making that marker, God can do so much. So thank you for your patience as I probably talked longer than I should have. And I pray that God will do great things in your life.